Hi, it's Robin. Let's try that again. Hi, it's Robin. That is my Commodore 128 playing a sample, playing a digi, as they're sometimes known, a digital sound file, like a WAV file on a PC. But what's kind of remarkable about it is it's just a basic program. I'll show it to you. There's a bit to it, but the part that actually does the playback is just here at line 220. It's simply using that buggy play command that we've been talking about in previous episodes. And this is maybe a new discovery. I don't know if anybody's ever used the play command to play back samples, to play back digital sounds before, or digis, as I'll probably call them for the rest of this episode. We'll dig into how this discovery was made and how the program works in a bit. But we'll just try a few other examples. They take a while to load from my SD card here, so I'll just skip over the tedious loading part, but we'll just go ahead and run a few of them. So here's one you might know from the game Space Taxi. And here's another one from the famous game Ghostbusters. Ghostbusters! <laughs> and finally, here's a snippet from an old Commodore 64 commercial with a song, I Adore My 64. Now, how was this discovery made? After my last episode about the escape codes built into the C128 editor, at the beginning of that, I did an update about the play command because people seemed really interested in it, and they had a lot of suggestions about how the bug could be worked around. Now, S. Hobenthal made the claim that the volume bug isn't a bug at all. It simply plays the levels from 0 to 9 mapped to 0 to F. Instead of having 16 possible volumes, Commodore Basic just has 10 volume levels. Now saying this isn't a bug seemed ridiculous to me. Here's the Commodore 128 system guide. And on page 145, it says that the volume command expects a range of 0 to 15, and the default setting is 9. We know Commodore Basic doesn't behave that way. It ignores or only accepts the final digit, as we showed last time. This play U15 as C just plays the C, the note C at the volume 5. There's no difference in volume whether you have 5 or 15 or 5 it's the same volume. And that definitely doesn't match up with this part of the instruction manual. But on page 279, we have another take at this play command. The volume is just a range from 0 to 8. So this is in within the same book, contradictory. And then S. Hobenthal comes along and says that neither of these, <laughs> that there is no bug. It's just a range from 0 to 9, which doesn't match up with what either <laughs> page in this uh, manual says. So, what's the deal? So, this is what I should have done in the first place. I should have looked at the disassembly. So, if you just go in with the monitor command to the C128 monitor, if we disassemble at this location, it's actually 5 hex digits. But these last four digits are the actual address in C128 memory space. It's just got a 16-bit address space. But this indicates bank F, which doesn't really mean that there's 15 banks of 64K, or 16, <laughs> for a number from 0 to 15. A bank in C128 language is a particular configuration of RAM, ROM, and I.O. And bank F exposes the ROM in the computer, and we can examine it with the monitor. So we'll just disassemble at that location. And we can see here that it's grabbing some value, masking out the low nibble, and then oring it from a table, going to jump to a subroutine, and then storing it in the volume register. What is it doing here? Well, let's look at this table at 703C, and we're disassembling it. And here's the, the values from 0 to 1, and then jumps up 3, 5, 7, 8, A, which is 10 in decimal, C, which is 12, E, which is 14, 15, and that goes off into other numbers. So 
This leads me to believe that the commenter is completely correct that these 10 values are mapped from 0 here up to a maximum offset of 9, which is in that X register over here, and 9 is mapped to 15, and so on. So we have a roughly linear, but not completely linear, approximation where values 0 through 9 in decimal are mapped to 0 through F in hexadecimal for the volume. So when you do volume 9, it does indeed play at the maximum value of F, or 15 decimal. So as Hobenthal, you are completely correct. I might argue there's still some sort of bug here that letter U is ignored by the play command and how it doesn't match either set of documentation. But yes, the volume command appears to be designed to only accept a single decimal digit. So I looked into this even more and using the vice monitor on my Mac, I set a breakpoint whenever a write occurs to D418, which is 54296 in decimal. It's the volume register of the SID. The emulator triggers the monitor whenever a write goes through D418. So if I do a command like play 909, it turns out that three values are written through to the volume register. Previously, we thought it was only the last digit that was going through. But in fact, all three of these values, all three of these volume settings do go through to the SID, but only the last one sticks, so to speak. So that made me wonder. It didn't work in Vice, but on this real C128, you can actually write a series of nines and zeros through. And if you go back to that episode or two I did about trying to optimize basic using a guitar tuner, we were storing alternating values into the volume register and it was the clicks of changing the SID would make a pitch. So we can do something like for X equals 1 to 127, a string equals a string plus 9, 0, next. That builds a string. That's just an alternating series of 9 and zeros. I did 127 of them because the maximum length of a string is 255. Which I can prove that here. Yeah, string too long error. And I'll show you the string it generated. Just a bunch of nines and zeros. And then we can do the play command. And it makes that quick burst of noise. But you see, it does come through as a pitch. And if we do a whole series of those, for example, for x equals 1 to 100, play a string. Next. Now this isn't going to be pleasant to listen to, but... Okay, you get the idea that the play command is capable of generating a waveform. Now it's a kind of a messy, glitchy one. There's extra pauses caused by the loop. That introduces a bit of silence between each burst. And also because the video chip is active, it also creates some interference, which we can partially solve by surrounding this command like this. We'll turn fast on, which doubles the CPU speed and disables the VIC chip, which steals cycles from the CPU. Here we go. Woo! Sorry about that. <laughs> So that pitch, I did some measurements on that in Audacity and found the pitch was about 3000 hertz. I thought maybe it was 3013 to be precise, but I think I'm a little bit off on that, but somewhere around three kilohertz. So I mentioned this discovery both to my friend Jason, who was in the text adventure episode, and my friend Darren, who was in the Invader episode about the one button Invader game he had made for the 64. And both of them independently said, well, then you could use the play command 
to play digis back, to play samples back. So, never one to uh, pass by a bad idea. I gave it a try. By the way, you'll remember in my episode about speech synthesis, Sam also blanked the screen as it introduced some noise and, and the quality of his voice. It can run with the screen active, but the quality of the voice goes down. It's more gravelly, more gritty. So once I had this approximate value of three kilohertz in mind, I converted those samples you heard earlier with the free program Audacity. I turned them into mono files and then resampled them down to 6 kilohertz, roughly. 6026, I believe, is the frequency I chose, although I now think that's uh, a little high. It doesn't matter much. This is, this is not meant to be awesome audio. <laughs> this is a strange proof of concept, and if somebody wants to take this further, uh, maybe they can use what we've discovered here and uh, do even better with it. So what I did was I took that variety of files that I had as mp3s or waves or had recorded and then sampled them down to six kilohertz and that's because of Nyquist theorem. To digitally represent a given frequency you have to have double the number of samples. And Actually it's really easy to understand here is that a single cycle when we're looking at that 9090 wave. That's the highest possible frequency we can build and it requires two samples, the 9 and the 0, for a full cycle. So you need to run this at 6 kilohertz to hear a 3 kilohertz pitch. And that's why CD players run at 44.1 kilohertz 44 divided by 2 is 22, which is just a little bit above the best human hearing. Although, as we mentioned in another episode, as we get older, the highest frequencies are older middle-aged ears, if you're my average viewer here, drops. Okay, and then in Audacity, I saved it as a raw 8-bit file, which I then transferred onto an SD card that my micro IEC can read. Well, look at this messy directory I have here. And there's the Adore My 64 raw file, the Ghostbusters raw file, and so on. Adore My 64 sample that I think is six or seven seconds is 140 blocks. So that's about 35 kilobytes. <laughs> now this technique is fairly inefficient because we're saving it as an 8-bit file, but really it's only reading in not even 4 bits, 3 plus 1 bits worth of resolution. There's likely ways we could optimize this better, but that's not my purpose here today. So we'll just take a look at that sample player. And we'll just go through this here. Now this is optional, this first line fast. This is just to make the loading a bit faster. The loading is very slow because of the way we're doing it. We're opening a file, file number eight, device eight, and secondary address of zero, which is usually used for loading, but we can actually make it load any PRG file, and you just name it. And we're dimensioning array V string, which is for like volume. Because the C128 string can only have a maximum length of 255, values, and we're only using 254 actually, we need to build up an array of these play strings and then cycle through them. And I just chose 150 as an upper limit. Whatever size in blocks your raw file is, however many blocks it is, that's how many strings you're going to need in your array. Okay, and then here's the loop. It's going to read from file 8. So this command reads a single character into n string. And just because of the way that Commodore file access works. It's best to get it into a string. You know, this is the safest way to do it, although it is slow. And then we're converting from n string into an ASCII value. So that's a value from 0 to 255. And then we're dividing it by 25.6 to scale it down from a value of 0 to 9. And putting that in n. And then we're building up. b is initially 0, so the very first string. We're going to build it up changing that value from 0 to 9 back into a character from 0 to 9 and building up that string here. Then we're 
keeping track of how many characters we've stuffed in that first indexed string. And if we hit 254, then we're going to print the value out, although it's invisible in fast mode, just for debugging purposes or whatever. Then we're resetting A back to zero. If we do hit the end of the first string, then we increase B, which is just our index uh, blocks, for example, is what I was using here. And then we check the end of the file or check for the end of the file. If ST and 64 is not set, then we go back to 40 and do a loop. And ST is a special variable that shows the status of your last disk operation or last file operation. 64 is bit six, which is what detects end of file. Okay, and then I just set back to slow again. I, I separated these out just as I was writing this and debugging it. Okay, and then the playback is very simply just turning on fast mode. Actually, I was optimizing this a bit to slightly improve the sound quality. Let's get rid of those spaces. So from zero, which can be substituted with a period, to B, and then playing the string, and that just goes through all the strings that are available up to the maximum of B which was set up here during the loader. So that's it. So the playback is extremely simple as it needs to be for the speed required for this. Okay, so maybe somebody will find this interesting enough and try to improve upon what I've done here. I just thought it was really interesting and I'm not sure anybody's ever done it before. I did some Google searching and I don't know. So thank you very much to S. Hobenthal again for bringing this bug not a bug to my attention and then to various friends for suggesting this strange use of this whether we would call it a bug or not a bug it's like an extra feature hidden feature secret feature built in to the commodore 128 play command okay i hope that's it for this play command and well unless it's something really interesting uh we'll get on to other things i've been promising to go back to some C64 uh, assembly tutorials, and well, anyway, we got we got lots of other stuff planned. If you haven't subscribed already, please do. Thank you very much for watching, and we'll talk to you next time.